Thanks, guys, and thanks for inviting us uh, to this uh, today. Um, so it's a very strange thing what we're doing in ethnography a lot of the time, and um, I want to set this conversation up today to really then hand it over to the other speakers, able some issues that they're probably doing um, a lot better with than me right now. Um, it's funny seeing Brian in the room. I mean, Brian and I have been struggling with this notion of ethnography and how to do ethnography for probably longer than we want to admit to everybody, just in year terms, um, really since the mid-1990s. Um, we've been going at different physical cultural settings and, and studying different things. And one of the biggest issues has always been for me, um, this gap between, and I think this has probably plagued ethnographers um, in the field in a variety of different disciplines for a long time, the gap between what I've seen and what I'm able to talk about. And most of the stuff that I've done, at least, hasn't been sort of blitzkrieg forms of ethnography where I'm in for a couple of weeks or two months, six months. They've been long-term projects. And the sheer volume of what you see and what you feel and what you go through you know, deeply informs how you understand a particular culture. But that's often uh, lost in translation in terms of what I'm able to know and what I spend time you know, developing an experience with in the field versus then what I report. And we were talking about this at a conference just this past summer in Chichester in England about the idea that in, in so much of contemporary ethnography, at least in what I used to see as editor of the SSJ and now co-editor of qualitative research in sport, exercise and health is that, you know, what, what often gets ethnography and these complicated ethnographies that we do is then some sort of textual representation usually that relies on and privileges interviewing as the dominant form of knowledge that we take away from the field. And, you know, I often ask the question, why are we even doing ethnography anymore if all we're going to take is a few bunch, you know, a bunch of words from uh, participants and, and really summarize that as the ethnographic venture. And I think what we're going to talk about today, at least I hope we get to, is the idea that video in ethnography has been around for a long time. I mean, we talk about in, in the anthropology, really the, one of the first documented ethnographies is 1895 in the, in the study of a, a Senegalese uh, community. So we're not talking about relatively a new method, and that's often one of my frustrations when we talk about use of video or other mobile methods in ethnography, is that we've been at this for you know 120 years. Um, always you know, the question of why don't we use it more? How could we use it? How could we use it in effective ways without falling into uh, sort of the general pitfalls of what we normally fall into? And it's, as was mentioned from the very beginning, I mean, I've done some weird ethnographic research in some pretty strange communities and really varying communities. And one of the things that uh, I've learned over the course of time, whether it's studying, you know, the ticket scalpers that I did or tattoo artists or the people in, you know, fox hunting and dog racing communities is um, I'd like to, I'd like people to see what I see as one way of augmenting the descriptive process. Uh, but I also, have wandered around, you know, and playing with different forms of video as a way of representing things differently. And I'm going to talk about some tensions between, you know, using video as a descriptive aid versus versus using different forms of mobile technologies or video as a way of doing something about representation or reflexivity. Uh, my interest really also stems out of something that is still emerging here at the University of Toronto in our group. Um, and maybe we can talk about this a little bit later in questions. It's a project that I've uh, sort of developed with my graduate over the last couple of years called the Ethnoesthesia Project. And the use of ethnographic in video and film to study uh, different physical cultures. And we're playing around with it. And so my graduate students are doing far more interesting things than me in, in this context now that we've sort of opened the door about using uh, video. Um, just to set the table a little bit, We've been using this for a very long time, uh, again, ethnographic film. Um, one of the things that I think we've struggled with in my parent discipline in sociology, and then I think by extension now in the sociology of sport, that we now in some ways prefer to call physical cultural studies, is really dealing with and negotiating, and you know, I, it, it's not a discredit to anthropologists, but I think it's true, that sort of appearance of that colonialist legacy 
of going in and eroticizing or you know romanticizing the ethnographic other in taking a, a documentary film uh, crew to study some uh, you know, foreign tribe um, around the world as a way of sort of documenting this exotic reality. And I think for a lot of sociologists, um, at least you know in terms of uh, history, there was always sort of that tension between that notion of voyeuristic gaze and using documentary to really exacerbate or document differences between people versus using them as a tool to help uh, bridge understandings between people. And I think that's sort of the first phase in terms of our history with a relationship with video and ethnography. Um, it's then in that idea that you know, I think what visual anthropology got right and continues to get right in ethnographic filmmaking is the importance, and I think we all know this, and I reflect on this in my own work, of the need for people to see what you're seeing. And I talked about that in a minute ago, and I think it's probably one of the most frustrating things, I think, for anybody who does ethnography, especially in teaching context for me at the undergraduate or graduate level, is the ability to say, I know all these things about, about this group because I've seen it. Um, and I, I need you to understand and in some ways trust the validity uh, of what I'm writing about in these sort of realist ethnographic ventures because I've been there and I've seen the context. And that's one of the sort of the classic justifications of using video um, as a as a as a complement to you know, participant observation and field notes is that I need you to see the context, right? So what people do, how they do it, um, the processes that um, comprise everyday life, and I, and I think if we go back and, and understand that sort of that basic notion of what ethnography is, and that, you know, in the derivative of the Latin of sort of writing culture or writing people. Uh, it, it's historically been used as a central complement to understanding context. So when I make these grand theoretical or conceptual interpretations of the world, people can see uh, what I've seen, what I've seen, in order to understand the nuances of my theoretical interpretations. So it's not just in terms of unpacking the substance of what I'm seeing, but it's also this aid in the development of uh, a shared subjectivity around my conceptual interpretation. Reality. And I think that's really important because historically when we read sort of strict textual representations of ethnography, I mean, this comes up in our methods classes all the time. How can I trust your interpretations of something, right? If I don't see them, if I don't share in that reality, um, you could be making this up or uh, you could be interpreting this however you want. And I think video evidence allows us to understand in the one um, sense of it, the context to see um, how we interpret people making sense out of reality or doing reality in everyday context versus, uh, on the other hand, the other vein, um, us being allowed into what the researcher sees as a critical sort of audience check on you know, validity. And if we read a lot of the old um, visual anthropology literature, uh, this striking thing comes up that we use video evidence as a way of better understanding and having an informed conversation about the way in which we sort of mutually understand something. Um, so for me, it's always been, and I think about my own research ventures in, in, in this sense, um, I, get this, I get this great privilege in being able to do what I do. And I always say this, I say this is the greatest job I could ever conceive of, at least for me, because I've been given the license to go and hang around with a bunch of people in everyday life. Um, and I would really love to be able to show so much of that evidence as a way of letting people into these work into these worlds uh, in a way that I just I've never been able to capture accurately in any textual representation that I write. I mean, if you have a monograph form um, representation of this of this reality, a book length, I mean, you might have a couple hundred pages to describe this as thickly as you can. But for most of us in reducing these things down to a 20 page journal article or chapter, it becomes very difficult. So um, I've always sort of played around with that sort of classic sort of use of video evidence as a way of broadening and deepening our understanding about something. Um, so that's sort of really the first phase in the history of um, video ethnography here. But I think a second more critical one, and this speaks to, you know, where Brian and I you know, sort, of sh sort of share a history here, is really the push from cultural studies in the 1960s and the 1970s that really shifted focus to issues in representation. And if, if visual anthropology has sort of really kicked us in the butts to really, you know, in, in, in many ways, understand adding richness and depth to the way in which we can document our observations, 
cultural studies and certainly the subcultural studies that drew me into um, sociology in a, in a deeper way and work from the Birmingham School on, on subcultures really frame the understanding of how we write and represent ethnographic texts to show different voices and different perspectives from the field that we're here to force marginalize. Um, so that's one of the major influences of cultural studies is to shift the lens, start thinking about the politics of representation. And this isn't to suggest that other fields like feminist scholarship in and around the same time wasn't suggesting something very similar. And we look at, you know, the rituals, and we look at Hebdige stuff, on subcultures, and we look at all those fantastic ethnographic projects that came out from Willis and others in that ethnographic moment in the 1970s. One of the things that was critical for me as an ethnographer was starting to shift the lens towards not only the politics of representation and how we choose to represent people and really open ways that we could do this, but probably more importantly for me, was the shift in emphasis to visual culture. To really think, again, this predates any of the stuff that we do now, and we just sort of take for granted the notion of mass mediation of society. But the, the real sort of shift in emphasis on the positionality of the eye, and I mean the EYE, not the big eye, um, the eye in terms of how we see and do culture as an everyday representational practice. So it's visual ethnography in, in um, an anthropological sense, in sense really uh, forced us to attend to the way in which we might broaden our, the depth of our understanding by you know, documenting more with the camera as, a, as an aid to the ethnographer in showing the richness, context, and nuance of everyday life. I think the really critical work in the cultural studies movement in the 70s and 80s forced us to think about the way in which culture is done as a visual matter in, a, in, in sociology, anyway. Uh, to focus on the way we see and experience culture as a visual phenomenon. And it draws us to uh, consider different ways and different epistemological sensibilities to how we might document. So while it adds on to that visual anthropological um, sentiment, it also suggests that what we might be studying also is the visual aspects of life. And certainly to go beyond the text, beyond the written word as a way of, of showing literally the visual aspect of life. I think that then folds into sort of the third major formation, and that's that sort of crisis of representational turn that categorizes so much sociology, postmodern philosophy and thinking and epistemology and ontology in methods in the late 1980s and the early 1980s. The notion of opening up the text to uh, a multiple um, understanding, really the explosion implosion of traditional ethnographic methodologies to include <clears throat> different ways of knowing, <clears throat> excuse me, and different ways of seeing. So the impact of feminist, queer, colonial theory has taught us about a certain privilege of the classic ethnographer's eye and the way in which we need <laughs> ethnographer in terms of knowing and, the, and, the, and the, really the explosion of the way in which we could potentially see. I'm going to talk about that very briefly in a second. And I think the last moment here and sort of where we find ourselves now is the push in physical cultural studies because of the substance of so much of the work on the senses and on emotion and on feeling. And I mean that sort of the haptic, the, the, the sense-based notion of the way in which we all things. There's been a, a recent a new materialist push in so much of our research now. And I think of the work of Simone Folgar, Folgar and, and others. Um, in this new material sort of reality, um, researchers in PCS and the sociology of sport are figuring out the way in which we can bridge our understanding of the way in which we sense the world uh, into ethnographic texts and, and video and mobile methodologies of the way in which we can often do that. Uh, not without its problems, and I'll address those sort of very briefly, but um, I would think that there's three main uses, and this is just my reflections on, on the field. And we can certainly talk about this. And I, I would imagine that the other discussions are probably on the table is to the three main uses that I see now of video and ethnography are this. In the first instance, it's the classic sort of um, visual anthropological use. So I have a lot of students, or I see this at conferences, or I see this coming in the journal of evidence as a way of showing what I know, of showing what I've seen. 
showing the substance, using it as a supplement. Um, I think this is a legitimate use of video ethnography. I often question, though, how much we actually need to do this. If we're not going to do something epistemologically challenging through the use of video evidence, it just becomes an extension of the mind and an extension of the way of knowing to let people see. And if it's not really done without an effect, create an affect in the process of representation, I think we need to, as contemporary ethnographers, really challenge the way in which um, we do this. I'll give you an example of this. I showed this really frustrating 10-minute clip of on Ashtanga Yoga at, a, at a, a research conference at NASA a couple of years ago. And it was this pedantically boring sort of 10-minute clip of what goes on inside a yoga studio for you know ten minutes, and, and I did it without interpretation. I did it without you know sort of layering any account on it. it. Was just sort of the sound and the scape of yoga in the studio for you know ten minutes. And see after about two minutes, people starting to fidget in and around their chairs, thinking you know what the hell is this? Like why is he just showing me people doing this? And um, it wasn't just to show the contents of what goes on in a yoga studio, it was to show sort of the way in which um, silence, movement, um, affect all in that place. And so it's not just used as a supplement so that I don't have to try to textually describe, you know, what it is to pose in a particular place or what the place you know, looks like or the, you know, the features of it, it's done for another purpose. So my encouragement is to sort of, for students and researchers, to go beyond the use of film as just an extension, allow people into the worlds of others. And that, that sort of gets into the second dominant use of this is around the notion of reflex. And I think a lot of our students, and I see a lot of our work now in the use of you know, in ethnography, hinging around three dominant techniques, and that's photo voice, photo elicitation, um, and video diaries. And so these have been central techniques that um, young uh, researchers, sort of more seasoned colleagues in the field, have drawn in as a way of research participants and sort of more collaboratory projects with participants, um, as a way of, of going behind the camera in lots of ways or going behind the photograph to more actively bring them into the process of interpretation in the project. So again, it builds on that sort of postmodern sensibility of decentering the researcher as the subject and object of an ethnographic uh, research process and allowing for different voices to come in, uh, facilitated by uh, videos or photographs that we use from people. And sort of this is, this is sort of now almost commonplace in ethnographic research, you know, the notion that you have to be very reflexive and allow people into uh, ethnographies in different ways. That's a second use of it. I think the most exciting use of video right now uh, really builds on the research that Cassie Phoenix is doing, that Brett Smith is doing, Andy Sparks, Sarah Pink, uh, a colleague out, uh, Philip Vanini, uh, Jackie Allen Collinson, John Hockey. Uh, all these people are, are, are doing in terms of the way in which we can try to capture video in ethnography to bring us more sensually involved into the research process and a way of trying to bridge our understanding between how people experience the world conceptually and how we feel physical cultural studies. So how senses and feelings um, are tied up to identities and meaning making. I mean, it's a really complicated process. Um, Sarah Pink describes this as a way of trying to capture a sense of replacement in the research process, but I, I can't think of an ethnographic project that I've ever done that I didn't learn about what I was studying and in place and sort of how Merleau-Ponty talks about perception by perceiving physically what I'm doing. Um, it's a central part of the meaning making process. And unless we attend to how we're actively doing this, we sort of miss that sort of central way in which people describe intersubjectivity. So we have mobile methodologies. Um, we have people using GoPro pro cameras and strapping them on their heads to show the way in which movement is done in physical cultural settings as a way of getting to that sort of haptic sensual aspects of uh, physical culture as a way of integrating places, bodies, senses, and feelings. I think that's sort of the most exciting stuff that's coming out of video ethnography now. It's not just slapping uh, a video in there to say, you know, I know this project, this project has you know, developed because uh, I'm using a camera. It's the way in which the camera can be used to illustrate something different 
about the way in which we know things. Um, and, in, and just in closing, and, and I don't want to spend too much time setting this up, um, I think I would be, it would be remiss if we didn't talk about the obvious problems in doing this. And of course, the obvious problem, you know, number one, every research ethics board will say, you know, the ethics of using video. Um, for all the standard sort of pedantic reasons that ethics boards say this, you know, issues of anonymity and confidentiality, we also talk about research methods. Saying, you know, this goes back to old visual anthropology. Once you, you know, sort of plonk a camera down, how does that change things? How does that change the way in which people act? Um, does it become more of a, you know, Goffmanian sort of dramaturgical performance involving everybody, where people deliberately stage what they're doing? Um, a camera, and I'm certainly, um, you know, aware of this in my own research where I've used a camera, particularly in, in Ashtanga Yoga, in a setting that's meant to be a very quiet, reflexive, introspective practice. I then, you know, put a camera in, and you know, people are drawn to this, and it disrupts practice. So we have to be att attentive to that. Um, we have to also be attentive and aware that it's still two dimensions. And for all the critics of the, you know, sort of written word is just this flat text. Video ethnography can also be a very flat text. It may allow us to hear participants and see particular things, but unless we involve it sort of more interpretively to the way it goes, you know, it's just a sort of a cool sort of innovative technique that we can use, you know, using technology. But just by default, using video evidence doesn't mean that you've really added on anything to the performance of research or the way in which you can analyze and represent it. It has to be you know, spawn, um, consciously thought of as part of the epistemology of what you're doing and sort of your ontological position as a researcher, what I'm communicating about how people know things. Um, I would say this in my own sort of reflective practice. I'm dreadfully horrible at it right now in terms of my skill and my technique. Um, we have to interview people, we have to learn how to film them, or we have to learn how to you know, bridge these understandings. Just because we can pick up, you know, an iPhone 6 or 7 or a mobile uh, camera, it doesn't mean that we know how to use this. Um, and I think film students have taught me that, to say that one of the things that they resent um, quite dramatically is picking up cameras like this and that we can represent the world in these artistic and aesthetic and, and knowledge-based producing ways. I think if we're serious about this, we have to start looking methodologically at in, and incorporating this kind of training into our own practice. We need to start reaching out to other disciplines uh, to teach us how to better uh, to do this. Finally, criteria for assessment. How do we even assess this? I mean, we're still academics and we're still bound up by these horrible things like you know, validity and reliability. And even though we might want to draw on Richardson's notion of creative analytic practice, great 1999 piece in a journal of contemporary ethnography, we still have to wrestle around with in the process of trying to translate these things or publish them. How do we assess a colleague's use of video evidence and the diversity of forms and the diversity of evidence that's used? Now, this is particularly relevant to me as a journal editor. I often don't know what to do with in terms of sending them out to people direction in terms of, all right, how do you assess this as an academic text? Um, because as long as we frame this stuff academically, trying to fit academic stuff into it, we need to collectively decide on some criteria. Um, and, and for that reason, we have to be careful of and attentive to the different audiences that we bring into play here. And I think this is all frontier stuff for us in physical cultural studies. Because as the discipline and the sands beneath our feet are shifting, I think a lot of our, our, our uses and, and discussions of video ethnography still are yet to be deformed. I mean, they're still in their infancy. So that's why I'm particularly excited to be here today and to hear what other people think and to uh, understand what other people are doing in the field. Um, so with that, I'll say thank you. Um, and I'm, I'm very interested to see what, um, what you say. Thank you.